Hello everyone, my name is Albert Świdziński. I'm the Director of Analysis at Strategy and Future and we are here on the very end of the second day of the conference of the Warsaw Security Forum. It's been, I, I would imagine it were, that those were long two days, but thank you so much for being here with us, uh, Professor Hugh White. Um, Professor White, coming, coming from the down under to from the from Pacific Ocean, from the rivalry of the great two powers, coming to um, to Poland, so far away, and a land country, very much, with land dilemmas. How, how surprised were you when you arrived in Warsaw and gave a lecture to a, to a whole room full of people? Well, I was very surprised and very pleased, really, that so many people in Poland were interested in the work I've been doing on how Australia confronts the strategic challenges in our part of the world. There are lots of differences, of course. As you say, Australia is an island continent. Poland's very much a continental country. Uh, Australia faces the rising power of China. You could say that Poland faces the long-term challenge of living close to Russia. Uh, Poland's embedded in NATO, of course, whereas Australia is more on its own. So there are lots of differences, but there are also some important similarities. We both have depended a lot on the United States, Poland for several decades, Australia for a lot longer than that. We both very much look to the United States for our security and we therefore both have to ask very carefully what does the future of American power in Asia in Europe mean? How confident can we be that America will keep on playing the same role? And what do we do if we can't? So in Australia we ask the question, can Australia defend itself? Does it have to defend itself? Can it rely on its neighbours if we can't rely on the United States? And I find that Poland in some ways is wrestling with the same kinds of questions. And uh, so I think, although there are lots of differences, I think the similarities are quite significant. So what, what you propose is that Australia fundamentally reshapes, or at least goes back uh, to, to, to previous posture in response to, to the rise of China and what do you consider unlikelihood of the US continuous involvement over there? Well, it's a really critical question for us because we've depended on America and before America on Britain when they were the big power in Asia. We've defended, depended on them really for our whole history. So we've assumed that, that American power would prevent any serious threat to Australia emerging and we've assumed that if a serious threat did emerge, America would be there to rescue us from it. And I think both of those assumptions are now up for debate. I think particularly because America faces in China such a powerful rival. America, of course, has had lots of rivals in Asia before, the Soviet Union, Japan and so on. But it's never faced a rival as powerful as China is. I think China's economic growth has made it a very formidable adversary. I think the development of its military capabilities have made it harder for America to be sure that it could just win a war against China. And I think China's resolve is very deep. China. I think as it starts to exercise its growing power, is very determined to become, or perhaps you should say, to return to the position of being the leading power in East Asia. And I think in challenging America to take America's place as the leading power, it's got a great deal of resolve. And so when we look at that competition, we have to ask ourselves, how likely is it that America will win it? And if it doesn't win it, what will it do? And I think the chances that America will end up withdrawing from Asia not this year or next year, but say 20 years from now, is quite high. And if that's going to be the case, then we need to start rethinking our defences now, because the decisions we take now will determine the kinds of military forces we have to defend ourselves 20 or 30 years from now. So I have two strains, really, two, two, two thoughts here, because I, I've noticed that one part of the debate that, was, that really stood out, and I don't think it was ultimately answered, was the question of definitions, the yes. meaning of words. And perhaps there is a very different idea of what winning means or what overwhelming presence means for the United States and for China. Perhaps China doesn't see it as a, as such a singular, in such singular binary terms. And uh, number two, perhaps if the Chinese, and that's a, that I know that's a risky question in those, in those days of uh, emotional swaying and ca categorical statements, but perhaps if certain order in the Western Pacific is unavoidable reality. Perhaps accommodation, at least partial accommodation, is a rational attitude. Yes. Now these are really important questions. Look, um, uh, when, when, I, when I look at, at um, China today and ask what are its real ambitions, so, you know, what is it really trying to achieve, 
Uh, I don't believe China is really setting out to rule the world, to take America's place as the globally dominant hegemon. I don't think it really has ambitions in that direction, and I don't think it really has the capacity, even if it did have the ambitions. Of course, it'll be very influential economically across the world, in including in Europe, including, I would guess, in Poland. It will be a big economic player, and that will give it some influence. But it won't aim to have the kind of strategic strength, the kind of hegemonic position in, in Europe, for example, that I think Russia has in the past and perhaps in the moment uh, present seeks to achieve. I think though that China does look very much at trying to be the dominant power in East Asia, which is its own, its own part of the world. It's a little bit like America wants to be the dominant power in the Western Hemisphere, in its immediate neighbourhood, so to speak. I think China in East, in East Asia seeks to be the dominant power, and that's kind of good news for Europe, because it means that China's not setting out to dominate you, but it's not such good news for Australia. The second question, though, is very important. That is, is there some way to avoid that? Now, I think a lot of people in America, a lot of people in Australia too, uh, have in mind that we should just push back against China's challenge and try and prevent China realising its ambitions and try and preserve the US-led order in Asia, which has kept the region stable for so long. I don't think that's going to work because I think China is just too powerful to be compelled to accept American leadership now and in the future. But I do think it's possible that the US and China could reach some kind of accommodation, some kind of deal, whereby China is, becomes a stronger power in the region, has more influence, has a bigger say, and America remains engaged in the region, but plays a lesser role and accepts a kind of an equal sharing of power with China. So it's a kind of a condominium, or you might call it a concert of Asia. Now, it's a very complex concept. It would be very difficult to achieve it, but it's a clear possibility. And quite a few years ago, five years ago, I wrote a book in which I argued that this was the future that Australia and other countries in the region should argue for. And I thought it was a possibility then. I still think it's a possibility now but it's very hard to achieve. And so today, whilst I still think it's worth thinking about, I'm more pessimistic that we can achieve that kind of equal sharing. And I think it's more likely that we'll end up with a China that emerges as the dominant power in East Asia and America withdrawing. That's very hard to imagine. And certainly from an Australian point of view, it's not welcome. But I think we have to realistically acknowledge that that's the most likely outcome. Well, the scary thing about this is that usually those peace deals are worked out after major wars, yes. right? So this is, and th this war would be different. Yes, that's exactly right. What, that, that's quite right. What often happens in history, if we look, for example, at the concert of Europe that was established in, in Europe in 1815, or the, uh, the, the Versailles Treaty after 1918, uh, or the UN Charter in 1945, all of those were, um, uh, negotiations, deals that were done between great powers after they'd experienced a terrible hegemonic war. And it was, the, it, was the, it was the experience of that war and the determination to avoid another one which drove them to make the consequences necessary to do that kind of deal. And the argument I've made is that if what, what we should aim for in Asia is to get that kind of deal done without having the war first. Because, of course, um, uh, the, uh, the, the fact is that even the Second World War, with all its horrors, was still a war in which nuclear weapons only featured in the last few days. A future war between the US and China, I think, would be very likely to escalate into a major regional conflict and quite likely to escalate into a nuclear exchange. And I think, you know, since the end of the Cold War, we've become a little bit complacent about the threat of nuclear war. I think we need to be very conscious that when we see two nuclear armed great powers like America and China, competing with one another as strategic rivals for which will be the dominant power in the world's most dynamic region, that's exactly the sign of the situation where nuclear weapons should be used, could be used, and I think we need to be very conscious of that, of, of that risk, and, uh, and that, that's why I think it will be so dangerous to have the war first. We only, if we're going to have a deal, we need to have the deal before the war. Um, and there is a, you know, there's a significant risk that that won't happen there. I think there are, we have to be soberly recognised that the risk of a major conflict between the US and China is a long way from being inevitable, but the risk is quite high. Professor Wai, final question. 
when I listened to your debate with uh, Professor Meshheimer, there was a distinct feeling that Professor Meshheimer insisted that the time to, to choose is now. Yes. And there was a distinct feeling that you would rather not. Yes. At this point. Do you think, and this is also, I would imagine that this, this sort of pressure will exert itself around the globe, wherever those two interests are colliding. Yes. Uh, and again, unfortunately, this is the, the reality, as uh, one of the Australian politicians put it, Chinese are our customers. Yes. And Americans are our friends, which yes. is... Uh, he must have been talking to the Americans. Yes, that's right. <laughs> this yes. But um, do you think it really is time? Do you think the US is at the point where it, where it will seek to, seek to exert pressure and the time to choose is now? Well, it's a really critical question because, of course, Australia is very much set between America and China as their strategic rivalry escalates. China is our biggest trading partner. It's enormously important to our economic future. And we have a lot of other beneficial links with China. It's not just trade, although trade's most important. But on the other hand, America's our great ally. And, you know, we've relied, if you like, on China to make us rich and America to keep us safe. And the, and the slogan for Australian political leaders for a long time now is, we don't have to choose between America and China. We can have both. And what they mean is, what they mean is we don't want to choose between America and China. We certainly don't want to make that choice. We want to keep managing those two relationships as well as we can. And certainly Australian governments today are still determined to do that. But the fact is, as your question implies, that we are now coming, out, coming under more and more pressure, both from China and from America, to make that choice. Uh, America wants us to side very clearly with America in pushing back against China. And China wants us not to do that. They want us just to remain neutral. And uh, I do think we're coming closer to being forced to make that kind of choice. But it is worth asking ourselves what that choice really looks like. And this was where the debate I had with uh, Professor Mearsheimer became, I thought, uh, quite interesting. Because um, for some people in Australia, the choice that I've just presented is the way it is. If we side with China, we'll be, we'll, we'll, our economy will be OK. If we side with, with America, our security will be OK. We just have to make a choice as to which one we want. But I'm not sure it's like that, because I don't think siding with America will make Australia secure, because I don't think America has a plan, a, a realisable, a practical plan, to confront China's challenge and sustain its position as the leading power in Asia. So the worst mistake Australia could make would be to sacrifice our relationship with China, to back America, only to find America fail to respond effectively to China's challenge withdraw from the region and leave Australia back in the region, stuck in the region with an angry and alienated China and without American support. So that's why I argue that we should keep on trying to manage that issue forward as long as we can. But if, if push comes to shove, we may find we have to say to the United States, no, we're not prepared to side with you against China at least we were not prepared to do that unless you have got a, you America have got a very clear plan to win this contest. And because I'm very pessimistic that America will have that plan, I think it's going to be very hard for us to side with them. A final one. Do you think, do you think this lack of plan is because of the challenge itself? The, the complexity of it, or is this a shortcoming of the US? And I don't, I, it's not a job at Trump. Mm. It's a job at overall quality of yeah. political circles. Of Look, I think it's a very good question. Um, you're absolutely right. This is not just a Donald Trump issue. Donald Trump is a symptom of something, but, he's, but I think the factors at work are much deeper. I, I do think there are serious deficiencies in the quality of American strategic assessment and policy making. Now that seems a harsh thing to say about a country and a system of government that I know well and that I admire deeply. But I think it's worth recognising that for years uh, most American strategic policy makers and experts were convinced that China wasn't seriously going to challenge the United States. And I think they just fundamentally got that wrong. Even today, when most American policy makers do acknowledge the significance of China's challenge, and do express their determination that America should push back and resist China's challenge, they still underestimate how powerful China is, and they still underestimate how much it will cost America and how difficult it will be. So I think there are failings in policy making and analysis in, in the Washington system. But going to the second part of your question, I do think even if the US policy making community was working at its best, even if there was 
you know, Henry Kissinger and George Kennan and Big New Brzezinski and all of these great uh, strategic policy makers of the past, if they were all at work, I still think they'd find the, ch the, pro the problem almost insuperable. And the, re the simple reality is that China is the most formidable strategic adversary America has ever faced for the simple but vital reason that it's the first country America has ever confronted as a strategic rival with an economy bigger than America's. And I do think the size of the economy is really critical here. And so I, I don't think even with very artful, sober, effective strategic policy making, there'd be a ready answer to the question, how can America beat China? Professor White, thank you again for sticking with us so late into the evening. Thank you very much it's, for the conversation. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for your interest. I've enjoyed it. Thank you.